So why does it matter what the earth has shaped, the world that we live in? Well, it actually does. It matters a great deal. And I want to show you why with this camera and uh, the one that I'm filming with right now. My iPhone, this is a Coolpix P900, very effective at showing you a world maybe you haven't seen with this from this perspective. The perspective that I'm seeing and that I'm wanting to share with you is the flat level plane that's being displayed with the water right here, okay? The reason why the shape of the world matters is the Bible got it right, modern science got it wrong. It's more than they got it wrong. It's an intentional deception by Satan himself to deceive humanity into believing that they're a cosmic cough a rather irrelevant piece of the existence of our universe. Couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible tells us that God's world that he created, that he put us to live in, is not moving. Also, that the sun and the moon give off their own light and they move above the face of the earth. The stars are in the firmament which separates the waters above from the waters below. You may want to look into this. What's really important about this is that the people that we've trusted to bring us the truth, to help us know what is going on, to give us maybe fair and balanced coverage, <laughs> well, a lot of lies are being projected through multimedia. Think of all the globe images that we've seen from Universal Studios that has a spinning globe in their, in their marquee, in their uh, lead into a film, before they give you your programming, they're already giving you your programming. So we've just come off of an election uh, campaign. Many of us are aware that there's a lot of deception and that politicians lie. That's a given. That governments lie and they control and sometimes they're very evil. Okay, what I want to share with you is that Satan is the father of lies. God's word is true all others are suspect and should be compared to the reality that's taught in scripture that's proclaimed in god's word what i'm wanting to do is to show you god's creation the majesty and beauty of his creation concurrently with exposing the lies and sharing his word in the process it's a multifaceted approach leveraging social media and modern cinematography to be able to show you a world from a different light in a different perspective many of you have not seen it like this this water is flat it is a level plane the majority of our world uh, most would agree is covered by water there is a raised surface that comes up out of it in this area we've got tidal pools and a washboard surface where little bits of sand come up. Well, in other parts of this world, we've got uh, islands. This little island over here, how tall is that? I don't know, maybe 75, 100 feet, um, the tops of the trees. I can see an eagle in, the over, uh, in that tall bunch of trees right over there right now. I filmed them before. Uh, the deal is we've got elevation in this world above and below sea level. This is actually below sea level right now. The tide is going out. We've got elevation over five miles tall with Mount Everest, and the Marianas Trench is over seven miles deep, supposedly. I believe it to be that. Uh, the important thing is that all the news media, for the almost all of it, has missed this, talking the, the truth about the biblical cosmology about the way this world is shaped it matters because the governments of the world the space programs of the world the media of the world from playboy and penthouse to cnn and abc and and fox news they're all controlled by the architect of deception satan himself the scientific community largely controlled by satan Gravity is non-existent. It's a lie that goes along with the global lie that explains why we're not flying off into space. 
it somehow is holding the water in place. It's non-existent. The reason why things don't go flying off is because this is basically flat. Uh, we're not actually on the flat earth. I want to distance myself a little bit from that flat earth movement. There's an intentional disinformation group called the Flat Earth Society, not trustworthy. There's also, uh, because they've got beliefs that are not accurate at all. And then Eric Dubé has taught me a lot about the way this world works as far as the water and different physical properties of the water. Unfortunately, he came up with a video on YouTube that says Jesus never existed. He got that wrong. It doesn't matter how, so I'm distancing myself from Eric Dubé. Hopefully at some point in his human experience, he'll be born again. I'm not intimidated by letters around names, doctors of divinity, doctors of medicine, none of it. Doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that the Holy Spirit lives in and through me, and he's helped me to realize that this world is not what we're being told it is. Is this the actual end time deception uh, that, that is on us right now? Second Thessalonians chapter two says, they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a powerful delusion that they'll believe the lie. What kind of lie? Well, there's a lot of lies that you can believe in it and you'll still end up in heaven. However, the, the truth about Jesus and that an individual needs to be born again to even see the kingdom of heaven, that's one that you need to get right or you're, you're not gonna end up going to heaven. That's why I share uh, the important message of hearing God's word as much as possible. The New Testament takes less than a day to hear. I do that most days because I enjoy that. I enjoy the encouragement that comes from hearing God's word, whether I'm riding the motorcycle, driving a car, walking on the beach, doing chores around the house, or sleeping, or almost sleeping. All of those times I mentioned, I couldn't be reading. That's my point. Um, yes, I read the Bible too. I just prefer listening to God's word because I can do that in a in a manner when I I can't I can't be reading it so it's important to question God I believe the important question to ask him like what I did am I really born again uh, I did ministry activity for 33 years and I was recently born again about two years ago the short version of that is I thought I was born again until I actually was I share that because the change in me is so significant that I understand that I'm a different person. The person I was died. Now, just so you're aware, roughly three people per second slip off into eternity without their body anymore. Their soul is going to go to heaven or hell. That's roughly 52.8 uh, million per year worldwide. Okay, so that's really important to know the truth about the state of your soul. The battleground is actually in our minds. What we see, hear, think, believe, do, all about that. What's hanging in the balance is our eternal soul. That's what's, that's what's up for, that's what's going on here. We need to be, be, we need to be born again or we're not gonna go to heaven. That's the bottom line on that. So that's why I leveraged the fantastic opportunity with modern cinematography, the iPhone that this is being filmed on, or my Nikon Coolpix, and then social media to share this to the ends of the earth, around the clock. Isn't that spectacular? Look at that.
I've been filming out here for about two years now. I would say this is the most spectacular day ever. I am so thankful to be one of God's children, to be born again, to have his spirit living in and through me. I'm alive. By and large, much of humanity is in a prison they don't know exists. The prison is their mind. What's held captive is their soul. I was one of those captives, captive to a smorgasbord of sin. I was addicted to pornography since I was five years old. Marijuana, alcohol, tobacco, self-righteousness, okay? So there are people that maybe don't struggle with chemicals, but if they're thinking they're gonna get to heaven by their own good works, or if there is a heaven, they're gonna go there because they haven't killed anybody, that's not how this works. We need to be born again to even see the kingdom of heaven. Some of these photos that I'm filming right now, or taking right now, will actually make it into the Perspectives of Creation album that I share with people. Roughly 16 million people come here per year in the South Carolina area to see the beauty that's out here. There's a whole bunch of people walking around on the beach with uh, their cell phones taking pictures. And then there's some that use professional equipment like I'm using. Well, this is a very effective way of interacting with people taking a camera and taking pretty pictures of the place they've chosen to go to, to enjoy a vacation together. So I'm able to interact with them. I'll say, did you see the, the eagles up in the tree over there? Or the, the horses out on the island? And they'll say, no. I'll say, well, I, I've got it on my Facebook. It's all public. So you can see it if you like. When somebody becomes a friend with me, I go ahead and include that album. I send it to them, private message that to them. Each one of my posts includes the Bible.com uh, logo or the hyperlink, the address. In a comment, it turns into a, uh, a picture of the Bible and a link they can click right on. Emails and so forth, it's, it hyperlinks as a little blue link. So I'm taking pictures and sharing the beauty of God's creation with people. What I want to do also is share with them a world that they don't realize in many cases exists, and that is heaven. Heaven and hell are real. I'm not telling a bunch of people to start doing and stop doing stuff. That's not what this is about. I'm not a legalistic individual at all. What I am sharing with people is that since I've been born again, my passion is to hear, share, and obey God's word. It's the greatest satisfaction ever. So his word is hidden in my heart. His Holy Spirit lives in and through me. What an absolute joy. So part of what's going to happen is this post will go up on Facebook and you'll recognize some of the beauty of this, not only in another video I've made today, but in the photos that will make it to the uh, to the album. You can make an album yourself if you want to. You can use your cell phone and post public on Facebook if you want to.
Job 1.14 And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Psalms 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Isaiah 40.22 And it is He who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Deuteronomy 4.19 And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole circle of heaven. Job 22.14 Thick clouds cover him, so that he cannot see, and he walks above on the circle of heaven to look upon the circle of the earth. Lately I've been doing a lot of thinking about the shape of the sky. My mind has been racing about the clouds and how they assist us in seeing the true shape of the sky and how it lays upon the earth. This may seem like a silly statement until you've looked up into the heavens with new eyes, and after seeing this video you will. I've been thinking a lot about the path of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Why we only see one side of the moon and how the sun, moon, and stars all change shape and size as they move into the horizon into their setting positions. I've been trying to figure out eclipses and finding new ways to use lens flares in order to prove new things to myself and to you all. After referencing the Bible, it dawned on me that I'm not the only one with these questions, thoughts, and theories, as well as ideas. The scriptures have been trying to tell us all of these things and more regarding the sky and many other mysteries. I follow in the footsteps of astronomers, sky watchers, and thinkers. Folks not happy with the information they've been fed their entire lives to excuse away normal occurrences. People just like you all. Scientists still have no idea why the sun and moon appear larger in the horizon and take on an oval shape while setting. Most people don't even know that this sort of thing even occurred. Well, I do, and these are the sorts of things I like to think about, and most importantly, figure out. While I've been speaking, some amazing and very important clips have been playing in the background. The reason why I've been showing these cloud videos is to show that the sky is most definitely flat and the clouds are a key ingredient into proving it. As you look into the sky, it appears to be a huge dome. But like many things in nature, it's just perspective and unfortunately not correct. It took me a long time to realize this, and hopefully soon you'll look at it with fresh eyes and realize it for yourself. Because the sooner you do, the sooner you can move on to more important things that can help you to solve real issues and unlock the simulation. I specifically chose the scriptures I did at the beginning of the video on purpose. It's because they used a very key Hebrew term which translates to a flat disk or a circle. This is exactly how they describe the sky and the heavens, amongst many other things in the Bible. If you need any scientific proof of this fact, you simply need to understand the workings of an equatorial mount, which is used for all computerized telescopes, tripods, and cameras for astrophotography and the likes. These mounts, using something called the right ascension and the declination, is used in order to find objects in the sky. This could be better known as the latitude and longitude of objects in the heavens. Imagine, if you will, a large clock or sundial floating directly above and parallel with the plane of the Earth. While the 12 o'clock position is facing directly north, you can use the hours, minutes, and second hands of the clock to face exactly where any object in question are located from your personal position, no matter where you may be located. This is only possible if the sky is flat and circular. Now let me be clear when I say that this is not a flat Earth video. Instead, this is a flat sky video. As a YouTube publisher, I do a lot of research about the topics I create videos on. I read too many books, magazines, white papers, patents, and the likes. I also watch arguably too much YouTube. I can honestly say that I've never seen or heard of a flat sky video online or off, so do yourself a favor and pay close attention. You're about to learn something. What you're about to learn blows the lid off many thoughts, theories, and ideas. A lot of these thoughts, theories, and ideas are some of my own of the past. But like everyone, we all need to keep our eyes and ears open to new proofs in order to connect the dots to unlocking this matrix. Let's take a look at subsuns. Here's the official definition of subsun taken from Wikipedia. 
A subsun is an optical phenomenon that appears as a glowing spot visible within clouds or mist when observed from above. The subsun appears directly below the actual sun, and this is caused by sunlight reflecting off numerous tiny ice crystals suspended in the atmosphere. Well, this is absolute BS, and let me tell you why. Try to remember this definition as you look through the video clips I've included, and I really won't need to. A phenomenon implies that subsuns don't happen very often, but in reality, I found so many clips of these subsuns from around the world here on YouTube, I ended up having to throw most of them away while making this video. In these clips, you'll notice that subsuns don't just appear within clouds or mist, and you won't only see them from above. You'll see them floating over water, snow, clouds, and just hovering in midair. Ice crystals have nothing to do with them, and I've included a clip or two where you can actually see the subsun while underneath them. And I have a strong feeling that the sun alone isn't what causes them. I've shown you all about a million times something I call space lenses. Mainstream science, patents, physics papers, and white papers typically call them floating solar membranes. No matter what they're called, they're all essentially lenses floating in lower Earth orbit as well as in our atmosphere. The reason for these lenses vary from obfuscating systems for black budget projects and tech in space to solar lensing systems used to spread direct UV rays to areas around the Earth that may need more of it. These are just two of the reasons out of a huge resume of jobs these lenses currently fill. These lenses are everywhere in the sky and are very easy to spot. Mainstream science and governments don't try to hide them, but they're also not going to chase you down just to discuss them. This is something you're going to need to find and research on your own if you ever want to learn more about them. Lucky for you, I've already given you all the information you need in order to search them online or off. Bob from Globebusters channel once said to me that the sun was a focal point of light shining through the earth from somewhere out there. At first I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I'm glad it stuck with me long enough to digest it and understand it fully. I believe the video clips of the sub suns show it best and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's 100% correct. The only thing these sub suns may be missing are an essential mix of ether and plasma in order to become something tangible or possibly even physical if that's something the body of the sun actually is. When we factor in all of the solar membranes, obfuscating systems, and black budget tech in between us and an unadulterated view of the sun itself, we could be looking at anything. Frankly, frankly, something like sunspots could be as simple as a chip on one of the solar lenses. Whom actually created the sun, the moon, and the stars has been a debate which has been going on since the sun's creation. It's hard for me not to choose sides when you see imagery of the sun being placed in the sky as a technology by humans. You can see pictures of this amazing feat on the walls of the Great Pyramids, temples of the Chinese, observatories of the Phoenicians, Minoans, and Mayans. This is just brushing the surface of this huge list of other civilizations who claim to be the one true light bearer of this world after placing the sun on its throne. And who is it that put the sun in the sky in the first place? My best guess is based off my research is of course past civilizations and or even the creator himself. I would never have given mythology like this another thought except for when you do your own research of the sun and find that it's more of a technology than it is a natural object. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the, in the heavens or our universe. When you look at it through your own telescope, most days it appears to be nothing more than just a huge white china ball floating over our heads. After you see some of the independent images and videos I've included in this video, you'll soon see why I feel it's more of a man-made technology than something natural made by the hands of the grand architect. When referencing the Bible in this discussion, it says itself that the sun, the moon, and the stars were created by a group called the Elohim and not Yahweh, Emmanuel, or Jehovah. Learning the definition of the term Elohim in Hebrew, you quickly discover these are magistrates of the Almighty and not the Almighty Himself. Not the Father, not the Son, or the Holy Spirit. Instead, a group of entities responsible for much, much more than just the Son's creation. 
The book of Genesis certainly gets mind-blowing when you translate it yourself versus stomaching the outdated translations we've been spoon-fed for our entire lives. Due to the sunspots on the surface of the star itself, we may be safe in assuming that its body is physical and possibly rotates on its axis. This may sound silly and way off our rocker, but NASA reports the sun is nothing more than 91% hydrogen and 9% plasma, so the two aren't far off from one another. This is a discussion and possibly a debate for another time, though. Offering full clarity, I'm just not there yet in my research in order to tackle that subject. Let's continue with other topics of discussion from my research that I'm more capable of hammering away at. Not 93 million years will you ever get me to believe that the sun is 93 million miles away in a burning hot ball of hydrogen. It's small and it's close. How close, I couldn't accurately tell you, but it's close enough that we just saw a plane appear to fly directly through it. Now, I'm well aware that the plane didn't actually fly through the sun, but I do believe it flew through the focal point of light the sun offers to the same part of the sky it kisses every day, every year, and from the beginning of its creation and time. It's also close enough to see through a telescope. Now let me explain. I refuse to believe that any consumer or prosumer grade telescope is capable of seeing anything hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, or even light years away. I don't care how big or how bright the celestial object may be. There's always going to be a standard distance for any recording device, including our own eyes, that prohibits you from seeing any further than a certain point or distance. Our own eyes that prohibits you from seeing any further than a certain point or distance. This most definitely includes recording or viewing the sun through a telescope, camera, or looking at it with your own eyes. This is a fact and backed up by piles of data. The furthest photo on record ever taken through a telescope with a camera here on Earth and through the atmosphere was a mountain range 260 miles away. It was so blurry and dark, it could have been a potato as far as I'm concerned. This was the furthest recorded shot I was able to verify as true. Of course, you're welcome to look for your own shot in order to compare the distances and capabilities for yourself. Moving forward, let's not forget the same photographer would be shooting through the same dense atmosphere here on Earth when pointing upward to record and capture a celestial body in space, but I digress. We are also expected to believe that our sun is 864,948 miles in diameter, but perfectly eclipsed by our moon, which is merely 238,855 miles away, but only 1,100 miles in diameter. That's a pill I just can't chew and definitely cannot swallow. That's not why we're here, and that's not what we're about to talk about. Simply. Just some facts I'd like you to remember as we continue down this path. Instead, let's discuss and view the path of the sun, the real path. This isn't your old science class, so close the window now if you're not prepared to take this bull by the horns, baby. The path movement of the sun are extremely easy to remember and track. The sun always moves from the southeast and travels throughout the day to the southwest across the equator, no matter where you're standing in the US. The reason why it travels in this manner is due to the traveling around the Earth in the same circular manner as the sky we've been watching this entire video. We know the sun is moving due to the size differences we can see and record throughout the day. If you're anything like me, you're most definitely itching to see some scientific proof backing this last statement up, so don't worry, I got you covered. Please pause this video and do a search for the next few white papers written and perfected by men and women much, much smarter than I. 1. The Michelson-Gale Experiment The Michelson-Morley Experiment The Michelson-Gale-Pearson Experiment The Sagnac Effect The Sagnac Experiment And of course my favorite, Aries Failure Once you've acquainted yourself with these amazing experiments, you'll fully understand what they do and that the world is much, much more than what you've expected and or have been taught in school. But, of course, you can just skip all this and spend a ton of money when you buy yourself a ring inferometer, this is an instrument alone shows you that it's everything else around us moving and not the earth spinning on its axis as we've been spoon fed since day one. 
If you're like me, then there's an experiment you can do at home outside of Aries failure, which will slap you across the face with this fact once you've completed it. All you need to do is jump back to our equatorial mount, which I described a bit earlier. Typically, when you align your computerized telescope, you do so by aligning the telescope on either the northern or southern star. As I'm in the northern hemisphere, like most of you watching, I simply set the axis of my EQ mount at 33 degrees and point it north towards the Polaris. Even if you don't have a clear view of the star, you just need to face north, set the axis to 33 degrees, and bam, you're off and running. Now, we spoke earlier about right ascension and declination. Here's how you can apply these measurements in order to make yourself feel better about all the flat sky points I've made here today. Neglecting atmospheric refraction, for an observer in the equator, declination is always zero degrees at east and west points of the horizon. At the north point, it's 90 degrees, and at the south point, it's negative 90 degrees. From the poles, declination is uniform around the entire horizon, approximately zero degrees. This means if you were standing at 57 degrees latitude in the northern hemisphere, you would need to point due southeast and then set your axis of your EQ mount to 33 degrees. This is when you'll find that your entire view will be filled up by nothing but the sun in your telescope. As the sun travels from southeast to southwest across the earth, you'll never have to change the axis of your scope from 33 degrees, meaning the elevation of the sun never changes. It doesn't go up and it certainly won't go down. It will just move from left to right across the southern horizon. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the sky is flat or it at least proves the sun doesn't change elevation the entire time it's moving across the earth. I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but this is exactly what the data presents. So, who am I to change it? Let's keep moving. The fact is, the sun gets larger and smaller in the sky depending on a few important factors. How close is the viewer? Is it overhead? Or is it located in the horizon? Atmosphere also plays a key role in perceived size, shape, and appearances at the sun's physical description and even its path. As you watch these video clips and or even in real life on your own, the sun will appear to rise up from the southeast and into the sky overhead before traveling down to the southwest into the horizon in order to set. In reality, it doesn't rise or set. It stays at the same exact elevation all day. When it appears to rise, it's actually just traveling towards you from far away. When it appears to set, it's actually just traveling away from you, far away, into the distance. This is called perception. And this is how you will, and always have, perceived the sun and the moon to travel in their paths across the sky. Now, that I've said it, and showed it, I hope that you can clear your minds of past beliefs and attempt to see it anew with fresh perspective. When discussing the movements of the sun, it's very difficult to show due to it being a featureless and textureless object in the sky. For this topic of discussion, you should use the moon to understand how the sun moves. The moon always shows us the same side. I too believe the sun is the same. This is one of the greatest proofs that the sky is flat as I've been showing. It rotates in a clockwise fashion as does the sun as it travels across the earth. The sky is flat and the moon is a parabolic shape like that of a mirror. This is very easy to prove when really taking the time to study its phases and the gradient shadows it leaves while rotating, exiting, and entering different phases. This shape for both the sun and the moon attributes to its changes as it travels away from the viewer and into the horizon. When the sun and the moon are overhead, they appear to be a small circle, and then they shapeshift into an egg shape when traveling away from the viewer and into the horizon, or aka setting. Once I understood these facts for myself, it is when I fully understood the sky is flat and not a dome as it appears. It's also a fact that there are multiple moons in our atmosphere, and it's very easy to prove this for yourself by taking photos and overlaying them on top of one another. You will quickly realize that the craters don't match up. It's my belief that there may also be multiple suns as well. This has been a topic of debate for a long time now, but it's not a hard fact to fathom if true. Anyone familiar with the personal sun theory will in fact find it very easy to understand how having multiple suns or points of light on the earth from the sun would quickly and easily explain how this is possible. If the sun isn't a physical object, then multiple focal points of light, aka sub-suns throughout the earth, would be very easy to imagine and even obtain. 
The builders created a main unit, aka the sun simulator, and separated the light out using these solar membranes or space lenses. You can see these same lenses around the moon, so it's very easy for me to believe this is fact which cannot entertain debate. It's my belief that I'm not the only astronomer that's discovered these solar membranes and space lenses throughout the skies. I believe NASA discovered how this system worked to light our construct and are now working hard to fix problems with the unit during times of solar minimum, or aka the dark ages. This would explain all of the times in the past few years where they've deactivated solar satellites and solar observatories to public viewing. Solar minimum is by far my best guess for why countries like China and the US have created and deployed moon simulators. I believe the original Sun Simulator units did in fact bounce light from the moon before the unit burnt out and the moon simulators went dark. Now America is using a holographic unit where the Chinese are using a physical object to simulate the structure. The space lenses and obfuscating lenses I've discovered are the greatest way of hiding these moons and Sun Simulators now in decay orbit. This may sound crazy, but 5 minutes of online research will verify everything I'm discussing here. With an archive of over 600 videos on these topics, you can easily look back into my YouTube video library and see all of these topics in great detail with first-hand recordings and proof of all of them. In short, I've already blown all of this stuff wide open and will continue to do so until the end of my days. The trickery is simple. The sun and the moon are no longer natural objects in space. I don't believe they ever really were depending on your definition of natural. The moon. One of the greatest theories of the moon's existence is that it was a byproduct of a meteor strike on the Gulf of Mexico, which then detached a huge swath of land creating what we know today. Others believe it's a man-made structure which was tossed into lower Earth orbit and is also what we know today. I myself lean towards a plasma-like structure which is ever-changing on its surface, in a way it's still a hologram and at the same time a focal point of light like that of the sun. Although the original moon was dependent on the sun to bounce light on its surface, it was still its own light source when no other light was available. The fact that the sun can't light up both coasts here in America at the same time tells me everything I need to know. It's 6 a.m. on the west coast here in Los Angeles, California and it's still dark. This means it's 9 a.m. on the east coast in New York and the sun is high in the sky. If the sun is 93 million miles away, but can't seem to light both coasts at the same time, then how am I to believe it can send light hundreds of millions of miles away to the far reaches of our solar system in order to light up places like Jupiter and Saturn? I just don't see it. If you read the book of Genesis, you quickly find that the Elohim created light before they created the sun. They also grew the plants in the Garden of Eden before there was a sun. This sends me to a great point, which has always bothered me, photosynthesis. Broken down, this is a Greek term, which means it's a theory that the plants need the sun in order to grow, when simply, it just isn't true. This is of course easy to prove, and here's how. Next time you find yourself with seeds, soil, and a pot, plant yourself something and then throw that plant into a dark cupboard. Yes, this plant will take a little longer to grow without sun, but it still will grow with no light at all. Now, when you introduce heat to the mix, you will find that plants actually grow taller and faster with only heat and water than they will do with sun, heat, and water. Yes, it's true. I too was mind blown. This is your boy Bugs. This is the Boogeyman channel. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and reviewing my research about our construct. Whether you agree or not, you took an important step into taking in new information or to connect the dots into your own research. As always, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe or die. You can always visit us at the number 4, T H E W O K E dot com and connect with us on our Discord chat server. Please find the links in the video description below. Any thoughts, theories, and ideas of your own are welcome in the comments section below, no matter how brutal. This this is the perfect place for him, so let her rip. We hope to hear from you soon, and we wish you a wonderful day. Take care and keep spinning, y'all.